do you feel transportation is affecting people's health in Rochester? Absolutely. Our health is really determined by our socioeconomic circumstance, by our environment, and by our behavior. And for that reason, it has really been fascinating for us to surface, to understand, and to share the important nexus between health and transportation. I really am struck by how clearly and how strongly we knew that the title of this report should be overloaded. What our data, I hope, is driving home is that it just sucks to be poor in this region because problem on top of problem on top of problem weighs down on folks in such a manner that they have to start prioritizing how to use their available bandwidth. And unfortunately, in that competition of how do you make ends meet when you've got too much month and not enough money, attending to health falls down the ladder and compounds mental and emotional health stressors. And I think it is incumbent on those of us who are involved in delivering health care to have a heightened sensitivity to just how overloaded these patients are in terms of managing their health and the health of their children and the health of their loved ones. And we've got to think about how it is systems change can occur to help make life easier for them as they try and meet their daily and weekly and monthly needs. St. Joe's Neighborhood Center is a healthcare center for people who are uninsured or underinsured or somehow just aren't able to afford the health care that they have. Quite a few years ago, St. Joe's Neighborhood Center started to keep track in some ways of what are called the social determinants of health. Um, and transportation is one of the determinants of, of people's health. We're very, very familiar with social determinants of health. Um, we realize that transportation is a barrier for a lot of people. And with that in mind, I will take a client who is 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50 minutes late. Um, to accommodate them and get them the services that they need. I do understand that transportation is an issue. It is a problem. It's not um, a simple, let me jump in my car for all my clients. They just don't have that luxury. So when they first come in to the neighborhood center and are screened to see if they're eligible for services, we ask if transportation is an issue. Um, and if it is, we try to explore more of how it might be an issue for them and then also see if we can address that. And with that in mind, we're just a little more lenient, a little more flexible. There are people who would uh, cancel or not be able to make appointments because of transportation needs, yes. So sometimes they may not have enough gas uh, to get to and from uh, in their own car. Sometimes it's a matter of bus fare or they might have had an all-day bus pass that they actually needed to use the prior day uh, as opposed to the day of their appointment because they had other errands to run or some kind of emergency or something. A lot of my clients actually walk. I get a lot of people from the Genesee Street area, Jefferson Avenue area, and they actually walk here because it's simpler to walk than actually to take a bus downtown to the transit center and then come on over to South Avenue. So that's one great thing I feel about the center is our location. It does um, give the ability for a lot of our clients, even from the Park Avenue area, Monroe Avenue area, they walk. It's also just where you locate yourself as an organization and how do you get closest to the people who might most need your services. So that was one of the reasons why when we had uh, started St. Joe's many years ago, the neighborhood was slightly different at the time, uh, but we tried to be close to where people might be, so close to downtown, on a bus line, uh, in a place where people might really need the services. And so that's a piece that I think many social service organizations could think about in terms of transportation is not so much how do we get people to where we are, but how do we go to where people are? Another finding, which is very clear, is we ask people about transportation being a barrier to accessing healthy food. 
And for households with incomes over $75,000 a year, only 2% tell us transportation is a barrier. It's at a third of respondents when we talk about those low-income households. And that's why groups like Foodlink are essential in this community. I, I think we think deeply here at Foodlink about the issue of poverty and food insecurity. Increasingly we're trying to understand how transportation and childcare and these other factors in people's lives play a role, but for many years we've felt powerless over influencing transportation and so a program like the Curbside Market was our answer to that. If we can't build a grocery store in your neighborhood right now and if we can't make sure you have a bus to get to the nearest grocery store, we're going to bring a mobile bus filled with really healthy product that that you can afford or you can use your SNAP benefits directly to you. And so that program has worked in the, that respect, but it certainly isn't fully meeting the needs and it in some ways proves the, the need for a greater answer to transportation for our residents. When we look by income strata, there's almost no difference in terms of the responses to folks who say, I agree that eating healthy is important to me. Taking a bus to a grocery store that serves food that's not just convenience food, that is healthy and nutritious, that doctors are saying this is what you need to eat, well, I don't have a way of getting there, and I don't have a way of eating this food. And if I have kids and I have to take these bags, and now I have new bags that I need to utilize to, to do this with, it's just one more barrier and one more barrier on top that our clients are having to face. This isn't a values issue. This isn't a knowledge issue. Poor folks just like the landed gentry understand what healthy eating requires and they want to eat healthy. The curbside market program started back in 2013. But it was really born out of initiative we started uh, 10 years ago where we had a pop-up farm stand in a single neighborhood um, in, in northeast Rochester. And we reached a lot of people but we realized how many limitations there were to just doing one single farm stand and how much uh, more impact we could have if we had a mobile solution to that. You have to keep in mind we are pulling right up to their door, they can come right on out and get what they, so it's the convenience that we're providing. So currently Currently, curbside market pulls up to nearly 100 sites in the summer months and around 70 in the winter months. So we do go to affordable housing sites, we go to uh, senior day programs, we'll go to schools, we go to um, the YMCA um, or YWCA, and we also go to, like I said, federal qualified health centers. I think what would surprise people is that we're in five rural counties as well, and we're also in low income housing areas in the suburbs where people are also struggling with food insecurity. It's like a store feel. You know, we set it up so that it makes it very easy for a customer to shop. After they shop, you know, they, we cash them out, and then boom, you know, they can just go on their way. They go right up to their apartment, put things away. They're bringing the healthy foods right into communities, and so their curbside market is an incredible asset for how it is we help these families that really want to eat healthy have reasonable and irrational means of doing so. I think over the years we've proven that there's a demand for curbside. We have high sales at a lot of these sites and it's uh, caused us to open up more and more. So I think if you're a resident of the city of Rochester, there's a good chance you have reasonable access to a curbside market, but it's not a permanent solution. We're, we go to each site one stop a week. So I think it still um, begs the question, how how do people on a regular basis access their full range of grocery needs? Folks in lower income households are very honest in saying that that which they will to do, which is to eat healthy, is not that which they are doing. In three. Exercise Express, we just recently moved from 232 South Plymouth Avenue um, and we came here um, with a collaboration with the City of Rochester. We work with individuals in the community that are in recovery, individuals that have mental health diagnoses, individuals that are low income, disenfranchised. From yoga, cycling, spin class, aerobics, we have a variety of, of workshops such as diabetes prevention program, medication adherence, 
and we have co-located with two other organizations. Um, the other organization is Somerset Moon. She's a massage therapist. Also, we have a program with the Wish Center of the University of Rochester, and they offer clinical services to our clients. And, you know, it's easier for them to get to lo one location and have all those services be provided in one space. I try to come every day, even when I'm not volunteering. I try to be here every day, just because I like the atmosphere. I like the way people are treated um, here. I just love it. I've been coming to Exercise Express for like three years now. I have transportation in the winter, but in the summer I ride my bike. The majority of our clients that come to Exercise Express, they usually come um, via walking, public transportation. Many of our clients ride bikes to our services. Many of our clients have medical transportation. So when you put services in, in one building, it alleviates the transportation from here to there to there to there. I come here a lot and exercise a lot because I suffer from anxiety and depression. And it helps me um, with that. I went through a lot of depression in the last few years and it's just a nice place to come and work out and they made a lot of wonderful friends. I try to encourage people to work out as much as they possibly can, even if they have those you know, issues and we all have some type of issue. But working out helps tremendously. So if anybody want to come to Exercise Express, we're here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love it when the music says, I start all over again. I won't make you happy. I think of as a community, if we're really serious about having equitable transportation, we need to have the long, hard conversation with ourselves that equal and equitable are not the same concept. So one solution that's going to work for one family may not work for another, and we need to be okay with saying this person might get what is perceived as more than another because transportation is a need. Same as food is a need and housing is a need, transportation is not a luxury. To get from one place to another, it is a need that in our society, I believe it's important that we help provide for everybody who needs it. And that's gonna look differently for different people. For some people, a bus pass might be that solution. For a mom who needs to get their child to daycare or to school and then to their job, a bus pass isn't going to cut it. So we need to have that long conversation. What does equity and equitable mean across a variety of continuum of what we serve? And then we have to be committed to trying to provide that with the different options that are available. Our services are offered strictly on walk-in. It's first come, first serve. Um, our doors open at nine. Most times to get from one side of the city to the other, it's usually about an hour and a half to two hour bus ride. Um, so for those folks to get there by nine, um, they gotta get on the bus probably by seven in the morning. And if they have children, that can be pretty challenging. Not only that, by nine o'clock, we already have a line at the door, um, and we serve the first 10 individuals that are there for financial cases. So if you get there and you're the 11th person and you just took a bus ride across the city, that's pretty discouraging. But if you had your own vehicle, you would have been able to be there fairly quickly. And so because they can't rely on public transportation for that next step on the ladder, they have to almost take three steps back to go out there and buy a car. And then if that car needs repairs, they'll sometimes choose that over rent because transportation keeps me going to my job. And if I don't have my job, then I don't have rent. And those decisions end up really setting families back because those, those crises that come up with the car repair or then the pending eviction, they end up robbing Peter to pay Paul and everything falls apart and they've got to start from zero. And that happens sometimes two or three times to somebody over the course of three or four years. I think we need to um, uh, first have a reliable public transportation. If we had that, people wouldn't be in the first place in need of buying their own car, uh, which is draining uh, much of their resources. I think that we have absolutely tipped the culture in our community to say that the conversations we were having 10 years ago about transportation and it's important to health and to well-being, which were scoffed at or seen as a marginal conversation, have now arrived center stage. It just impacts every 
every aspect of somebody's life, just not having that freedom and independence to make your own choice on how to get from one place to another. And that's that's been on our minds uh, a lot, is just who has access to what and uh, who designs those processes. Uh, you know, our lane is healthcare, but healthcare is absolutely impacted by transportation. I really think it's a matter of us understanding how as a community the change that we'd like to see is not going to descend from the stars nor will it roll in as Dr. King said on the wheels of inevitability but rather it's going to take the tireless and persistent struggles of dedicated individuals and I think that's what is one of the most exciting things to see in this community. If we can demonstrate that we don't necessarily need to rely on the personal automobile as the expression of freedom, but that what we really have is the chance to engage in a community transportation system as not only the expression of freedom, but the expression of community. I think what we wind up doing is truly transforming ourselves, not just in terms of our physical health, but again, in terms of our mental and our emotional well-being. <laughs>